Well, for more on the Brexit debate, I spoke to Brian Berry, an EU expert and contributing editor to European affairs. I asked what the path forward is for Britain two months after the referendum. Although it's unclear, we've seen quite a bit of momentum uh, in the sense that people have had this summer to think about what do we do now. And while some may say that it's still not inevitable that the UK will actually leave the EU, my sense is that everyone is now going on the operating assumption that it is. And so we're seeing the disparate sort of components of the UK um, beginning to mentally prepare themselves. And sort of we're in that mode now, even though the, the negotiations have yet to begin. And as you mentioned, the countries that make up the UK, we have England, we have Ireland, we have um, Northern Ireland, we have Wales and Scotland. How are they all differing in terms of their strategies about what they're going to do now? The one that has probably hit the headlines the most is Scotland, because it registered a very clear anti-Brexit vote, and because they had a referendum on independence two years ago. Um, in Scotland's case, the the leader of the devolved government, Nic Nicola Sturgeon, um, the first minister, is trying to gauge and drum up support for a new referendum on independence for Scotland. And we keep hearing Prime Minister Theresa May say Brexit means Brexit. But it's still a little bit unclear about the nature of what that Brexit is going to be. Some people think it will be a hard Brexit with them making trade deals with other countries. Others think there may be some concessions. What do you think potentially could be the scenario? I think we are seeing a bit more clarity as people have come back from the summer break. I think it's clear that the first step has to be an, uh, a deal on the terms in which the United Kingdom exits the EU, um, which will take uh, two years, potentially more, once those talks begin. And Theresa May says 2017, we'll see. Stage two will be the trade agreement between the United Kingdom and the European Union, with the UK no longer being in the European Union. And stage three, although it potentially could run parallel with stage two, would, would be the UK signing free trade deals with other countries around the world who are not members of the European Union. So it is certainly very messy, but we are at least beginning to see the outlines of, of what may lie, lie ahead. Now, we are still seeing a lot of pressure from the European Council for the UK to trigger Article 50 and begin its Brexit. Um, so far, as you said, Theresa May hasn't acted yet. So how does perhaps this ongoing limbo benefit or perhaps take away from the UK? They are constantly being viewed with suspicion now. And so everybody is thinking, well, if you're on the way out, why should we in any way give you a good deal, because then the first thing we're going to have to do is negotiate a new deal with you. And um, I think there's also a strange, even though the rest of most of the other EU member states did not want the Brexit to happen, there's a certain sense that like they would like the trigger to be pulled quickly on the negotiations and for them to proceed, because it has tr thrown the whole of the European Union into turmoil. And I'm sure they are keen to exit that turmoil, which in turn comes on the back of their Euro crisis turmoil and their Grexit turmoil and their refugee crisis turmoil. And so it's a very troubling time for the EU at the moment. Now, you, you mentioned this idea of obviously this, all these ongoing crises, and we saw the British pound did actually take a tumble after the European Central Bank said Brexit uncertainties could dampen the European economic recovery. So what do you make of that assessment? Uh, yes, uh, uncertainty uh, definitely could hurt the recovery. And remember, the, the recovery was very fragile. I think that the European Union was growing at about a 1% uh, rate. Um, the initial forecast uh, predicted that the UK would take the biggest hit. Um, but in more recent weeks, we are seeing a sense that while that may be true, that that might be a, a, a bit more of a temporary blip. Um, the long-term impact on the rest of the European Union, it's really still too early to say, I would say. So, Brian, we saw recently that Prime Minister Theresa May chided one of her most senior cabinet members for saying it's, quote, very improbable that the UK can control EU migration while remaining a member of the single market. What do you think is the significance of this? I think it highlights the fact that there's a lot of misinformation and misperceptions about the, ex about the status quo, because, in fact, 
the UK has an opt-out of EU migration policies in the sense that um, uh, border controls from non-EU countries. Um, there is still free movement of people uh, among EU member states, so Poles, Lithuanians have come to the UK in large numbers, and post-Brexit that could end. Um, however, Th Theresa May is indicating that she, uh, as long as she has guarantees that British people who live in other EU countries can continue to do so and work there, that she is amenable to guaranteeing that for the other EU nationals. So, uh, but I do think that um, during the run-up to the referendum, people were often uninformed about the fact that the UK already controls its own borders. It is not part of the Schengen uh, common travel area within the EU.